I V M. Before you listen to this episode of the Seen and the Unseen, I have a recommendation for you. Do check out Pulya Bazi, hosted by Saurabh Chandra and Pranay Kotesane, two really good friends of mine. Kickass podcast in Hindi. It's amazing. While reading Parvati Sharma's excellent biography of the Mughal Emperor Jahangir, I came across an anecdote that reminded me of the economic management of modern Indian governments. One day, Jahangir, filled with curiosity about the natural world, saw a snake swallowing a rabbit. The mighty emperor wanted deeper insight into the mysterious workings of the animal world, especially the digestive system of a snake. So he commanded his minions to capture the snake so that he could watch it eating the rabbit, and then later cut it open to. see the inside story of the ingestion the startled minions who must have felt a bit like rabbits themselves caught the snake the equally startled snake immediately lost its appetite and the rabbit popped back out of its undoubtedly cavernous mouth jahangir's natural experiment it seemed was at an end but not for nothing is a mughal emperor a mughal emperor the mighty jahangir ordered his men to stuff the rabbit back into the snake's mouth the snake does a face palm right now as best as snakes can do face palm but it can do no more in this undoubtedly wtf moment and it certainly cannot swallow a damn rabbit so you have have jahangir's minions holding the snake forcing his mouth open and shoving the rabbit inside in the process the mouth of the hapless snake is torn and it perishes not the first or last victim of the whims of an autocrat drunk on power and this reminded me of modern times because we see many of our leaders treat our economy just as jahangir treated that snake i wish jahangir had just left that snake alone the moral of the story as you would have guessed by now is this The snake died. Welcome to the seen and the unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to the scene in the unseen. My guest today is Parvati Sharma, and we'll be talking about her book Jahangir, an intimate portrait of a great Mughal. This is not only a serious book of history that contained many insights and TIL moments for me, but it was also a fantastically entertaining book to read with many moments that made me laugh out loud. Also, as much as it is a book of history, it is also a story about people with all their flaws and insecurities and idiosyncrasies. It's quite apt. to call this as the subtitle of the book suggests an intimate portrait because i did feel like i got some insight into jahangir the man through this book i also have another reason for doing this episode every episode of the seen and the unseen through its nearly 150 episode history has featured a varma i have never had a sharma on the show like me are you someone who loves fine art but can't really afford to have paintings by the artists you like hanging on your walls well worry no more head on over to indiancolors.com indian colors is a company that licenses images of the finest modern art from some of the best artists in india and adapts them into objects of everyday use these include wearable art like stoles and shrugs home decor like cushion covers and table runners and accessories like tote bags this allows art lovers to actually get fine art into their homes at an accessible price and artists get royalties on sales just like authors do what's more indian colors now has an exciting range of new products including fridge magnets with some stunning motifs and salad bowls and platters made of mango wood their artists include luminaries like babu xavier vasvo xvasvo brinda miller dilip sharma shruti nelson and pradeep mishra they accept bulk orders for corporate and festival gifting but even if you want to buy just for yourself or a friend head on over to indiancolors.com that's colors with an o u And if you want a twenty percent discount, apply the code IVM twenty. That's IVM for IVM podcast. IVM twenty for a twenty percent discount at IndianColors dot com. Parvati, welcome to the scene and the unseen. Thank you very much, Amit. It's lovely to be here. Glad to be the first Sharma on your show. Yes. And uh, and that story that you told about the snake that was I'm glad you picked that. That was one of my I had many favorite stories when I was writing this book. And I you know people used to. Get a little worried when they saw me approach, but I just couldn't stop telling them my Jahangir stories. The latest mad thing I had read of this man doing, and this was this was one of my top top five. This is a fantastic story, but there are, like you said, so many fantastic stories, and we'll you know come back to some of them during our conversation. Uh, before we get to uh, uh, ancient times, and before we get to Jahangir, you know, let's talk a little bit more about yourself. Uh, I've heard you mention that you didn't really like history in school. 
Uh, no, I won't say I didn't like history in school. I, I think for, for much of my schooling, I was sort of indifferent to it, only in the sense that it was, uh, it, it didn't seem to go anywhere or mean anything, and, um, and it was just these sort of abstractions and these dates and these names, you know, and the, the Mauryas and the Guptas and the. Cholas and the Pandyas and the Pallavas and the Rashtrakutas and Anna, the Mughals. Anna Sunny Deol would say Tariq pe Tariq. Tariq pe Tariq, <laughs> yes. And none of it added up to anything. But I think I did begin to enjoy it towards the end, like in my 11th and 12th standard. And uh, But even then I didn't, in college I was always drawn towards literature and that's what I wanted to study. But, uh, but I think after three years of English, I wanted to do... Uh, sort of what I thought at the time rather naively, real stories. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to I wanted to know like true things. So so then I went back to studying history, uh, and uh, that's when I really began to, uh, you know, because began to enjoy it because I think that sort of the disciplines of uh, literature and history are not very mm-hmm. far apart. Because some of similar sort of uh, faculties, and uh, have similar pleasures. Yeah. And and did you always want to be a writer? I always wanted to be a writer, yes. From, uh, I don't even know from when. I mean, I always wanted to be a writer. Also always wanted to be published. And and you know, as the older I got, uh, and the less published I was, <laughs> the sadder I became. And I remember, you know, I think turning 30, which was also a stressful moment. And, you know, and, and generally bewailing my fate and saying, oh, I will never, never be published. Uh, and a friend said to me, she said that, you know, if you don't write, what will anyone publish? And uh, and then, you know, we were talking earlier about discipline in, in, in writing. Yeah. And uh, and that's when I started doing this, at her suggestion only, at writing every day. Like she said, you, know, you just sit and write for one hour every day, or at least sit in front of your computer for one hour every day, regardless of what comes out. And I started doing that like exercise and... Uh, and it, you know, it worked because it's like a muscle. You, you, you mm. know, you, you, uh, you strengthen it the more you do it. Um, so yeah, so that I think is when I started writing with some kind of plan. But uh, but much before that, I mean, from as long back as I can remember, I was sort of scribbling away in, in diaries and things and trying to imitate whatever, whoever I liked at the moment, at that time, whichever writer I was reading, I wanted to, you know, be that writer. So, uh, yeah. It sounds very similar to me. Uh, I, I remember when as a kid I used to read Shakespeare, I had this brief phase when I tried to write like Shakespeare yes. in that language, which is extremely silly and don't try this at home. Yeah. And and I also was unpublished before 30. And it's interesting, you know, our mutual friend Manu Pillai was on the show. Yes, and he's he went, not 30. Uh, yeah, he's just about to turn 30 or turn yeah. 30. And he mentioned to me while, before, you know, while we were having coffee before one of his shows. And it made me very angry. I wanted to punch him. <laughs> he said that, you know, this book has fulfilled an ambition of mine. And I said, what is that? Yeah. And he said, I wanted to write three books before I was 30. <laughs> and I was like, this kid has barely started shaving and uh, reaching such heights. But yeah. now you also have written uh, many books. And so to start with, did you you saw yourself as a writer of fiction, right? Always, yeah. yeah. That was what I always wanted to write. And uh, um, it's also what I always enjoyed reading. The You know, it was, I loved books and fiction. and uh, So I wanted to write them. Uh, who was who was sort of the writers that you really liked, or the writers that you thought that you might one day write like? I mean, in the sense that's sort of my space, that kind of thing. You know, so like you say, so so every every at that moment, whoever it was, so 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 like your Shakespeare, I also um, I took on Dostoevsky at <laughs> the age of I think sixteen or seventeen. I read Crime and Punishment, and I didn't like the ending at all. I was like, what is this? I can mm-hmm. do better. Did you? <laughs> I rewrote the ending. <laughs> you rewrote the ending of Crime and Punishment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, the punishment for that was that I was not able to write anything worthwhile until I was 30. This kind of arrogance should not just go ignored by the universe. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, but I suppose some like deep influences, you know, from childhood, I think I think Roald Dahl was one. Something about, and even now, I think something about just that 
and that sort of manic flow, momentum and energy that he has in all his writing, both for adults and children, is something that I, you know, would aspire to. P.G. Woodhouse, of course, was... I remember, I think, also sometime in college reading uh, The God of Small Things and really being completely blown away by it. Uh, I think I started at night, something after dinner and I read the whole night. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, I, and, I, uh, and I think part of the reason, I mean, it was, the, the way it was written and all that, of course, was fantastic. But also somehow it, at that time, in that place, it was somehow reflecting a world that I knew, which was unusual, you know, still at that time in uh, fiction that I was reading. Uh, even in fiction written by Indians, it was unusual. So, yeah, I mean... Uh, and that's very interesting because I can understand why you are a fan of Roald Dahl and because, you know, like him, again, you've written for both adults and children. Mm. Uh, the Arundhati Roy took me a little by surprise because your voice is very different in a good way in the sense that, I mean, I'm not a... Uh, my personal bias is that I'm not a fan of the very highly stylized kind of writers for whom language is very important. And I find people like uh, Rashti and Arundhati a little excessive in that sense that your over, your attention is constantly drawn to the writing mm-hmm. style. And I find that your style is, say, much more in a way of, say, a Vikram say it, very understated and very clear. And uh, did you, you know, in your process of sort of writing, and especially when you were writing your uh, children's uh, books, did you find yourself giving a lot of thought to, say, the craft of writing? How do you write sentences? How do you put together narratives? Uh, what should you do? What should you not do? Yeah, I think, you know, with every book, it's been something that, you know, some something I've, that, that, that I've had to learn in order to, in order to do it. And, uh, I think, you know, my first book was a collection of short stories. And um, I think there, a lot of the focus was on the craft of writing as just the the sentence level stuff, you know, and that, which I enjoyed, and for me was the least taxing. And for me, I find as a writer, the most difficult thing is plotting. And which is the, the sort of barrier I encountered when I, you know, after that I wanted to, you know, I wanted to write a novel. And uh, and you can't, I mean, doing sort of meandering plotless short stories is one thing, but plotless novel is, is a whole other thing. And, and of course you can do that, but plotless novels are not even novels that I enjoy reading. I mean, I like plots. I like a story. I like, uh, and I realized that it's, to me, I think four years and about six revisions to get that very slim novella done uh, because I was uh, and in the end I realized what the problem was not just that the plot uh, was not falling into place but also uh, there was no momentum building and the two things have to go together you know you have to have a kind of momentum build up to take the plot from one thing to the next um so that was a difficult sort of experience. And I think the similar thing I learned with that, after that I did this book for children, The Story of Barber. And uh, there I learned the same thing, but even more, you know, because with kids, there was very little room for anything that is not moving the action forward. You know, something has to be happening. And I found that that was very energizing for me to have to do that you know as as a writer it, that was great fun of it that you know that there was no there was no diversions there were no digressions you were just going from one thing to the next and you know maintain had to maintain interest and, uh, and, and action do, do you feel that changed you as a writer in general writing for children i think so i do i felt i felt a kind of livelier spirit i don't know if that how that sounds but yeah, I, I felt a greater energy. And I went from there, I was working on another novel, and I wrote that novel with something of that, you know, uh, ch- children's book momentum and energy in mind, and it did, it helped, it really did. It was a... And, and so your first brush with writing history would therefore have been the book on Babur. Correct. Okay. And uh, like, of course, you had a ready-made plot there. Yeah. But uh, did the process of writing that book sort of change the way you look at the Mughals or the or you, the way you looked at the history of that period? I, I, don't, I don't know if it, did, it changed it because I, I didn't even thought, you know, of that much about... Mm-hmm. Um, 
history in general or the Mughals in particular, except in the way that, you know, everyone sort of, when you, you come across something or, you know, but I hadn't really taken any, you know, particular trouble to find out anything. Yeah. And, uh, but it did, it, it, it took me completely by surprise. Was, what, what took me completely by surprise was the Babar Nama, which, uh, you know, I started reading, not, not really knowing what to expect and not, uh, and, and really actually expecting more some kind of sort of dry recital of events or, you know, or, or sort of um, dates and, and facts and figures and things like that. And uh, instead it turned out to be this really, um, really sort of lucid, unselfconscious uh, account of this, of this man's life. And it, and, you know, right in the beginning, like within the first few pages, uh, there's a there's a there's a description. A barber is talking about his father overeating. <laughs> overeating. He was sort of rotund man, mm -hmm. and once he had eaten and feasted, he would he was also sort of cheerful. He would laugh, and uh, the he says the the laces of his tunic would would snap open, and you know immediately like the the image you get is of this young child watching his father, the king. You know his his laces of his tunic snapping open, and there's a sort of little mischief and humor and, and, that's and such affection. A detail also. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. that's also, yeah. So, so you know that 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 kind of detail that uh, I wasn't expecting at all, but it really helped to get a sense of Babar the of, man. of Babar the man. And, uh, and and yet the Baba Nama is very different from, for example, the Jahangir Nama, mm. in the sense that you mentioned how the Jahangir Nama is really Jahangir was keeping a diary, so it's not like a narrative written mm. after a period of time. It's yeah. life unfolding as it is, and it has that immediacy and uh, the seeming candor. And uh, the Baba Nama, Baba, you've mentioned that he was sort of writing it with an eye on history as well. It's also an act of, you know, creating a narrative about himself. He is sort of writing it as his memoirs, mm. and uh, and Jahangir is writing it as his diary. So there is, in that sense, just the texture of it is different. You know, Bhavanama is more like a record of significant things that happened in his life, but uh, Jahangir is like exciting things happened yesterday. Yeah. You know yeah. that uh, I saw a snake eating saw... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 And and let, let's kind of come to Jahangir. And it, it's very interesting that you chose Jahangir as a subject because typically when you think of the Mughals, of course, there were sort of six great Mughals before the decline began, which is Babur Humayun, Akbar Jahangir, Shah Jahan and the infamous Aurangzeb. Mm. And Jahangir is sort of like a lost figure who for a long time has not been taken seriously by historians so much. He's, uh, you know, he's been painted as ineffectual he is not focused on conquering new territory like emperors are he he's sort of a, a weak man he drinks a lot and so on but <laughs> one of the things that i learned while reading your book was that historians are now beginning to feel that he wasn't necessarily like this that these are the imperatives that come from one how shah jahan wanted to portray him mm. to sort of justify his own acts and uh, uh, to the, the the work of thomas Rowe, the east mm. india company mm. uh, um, emissary who was uh, at the time there and he also had his own incentives if i may use a term i use often on the show in painting jahangir in a particular way T tell me a little bit about this yeah, no, so that was that was interesting for me also to discover. This this particular argument is made by uh, Corinne Lefebvre, who's a, a French historian who uh, is sort of re-evaluating both Jahangir's life and the Jahangir Nama. And it's true, even, so when I was writing uh, this book, in the first draft of it, the idea that I had of this man was of... Um, like a sort of well-meaning, amiable, but dissolute overall, um, not 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 sort of a lightweight, you know, entertaining, but not for the ages. You know, and I mean, on the other hand, he ruled for twenty-two years. But even that, uh, the generally accepted sense that you gather if you read, you know, around him, is that uh, Akbar had built up such a strong empire that uh, you would need you know another akbar to even to 
undo it you know even that would require more uh, sort of uh, energy than uh, jahangir was inclined to display in his life uh, but you know i was i was i was discussing this with a friend who's also a historian who, who was a great help to me in the writing of this book um, yeah, anuhuti maurya well you know but she said it's not really necessarily true that just on the momentum of akbar's centralization of power and creation of empire that jahangir would have been able to rule for 22 years because uh, you know dynasties could can collapse at any time i mean even even today you can have uh, governments falling or uh, you know countries changing overnight that can happen uh, so certainly you know that it's worth thinking that you know he must have been doing something right and then uh, it was in fact anuguti who introduced me to the work of uh, this korean the fact and uh, she's written this fantastic in which he makes this argument that you know this idea that we have of jahangir being the sort of weak link controlled by his wife and uh, not really up to much well comes from one the fact that there is for contemporary accounts of his reign are limited only to him there's only the jahangir nama because you know if the emperor is writing his own uh diary then who your history who else will uh, will dare to and then there is uh, this uh, propaganda that that travels down uh, almost 400 years unchanged uh, via shah jahan his historians who come after after jahangir and shah jahan rebelled against his father in the last years of his reign and they never quite make up uh, so once shah jahan ascends the throne he has to justify his rebellion and uh, and the only way he can and he can't justify it by saying that um he can't say that you know there was something that jahangir was a bad king because that would then justify rebellion against him you cannot rebel against the emperor so he has to say that he was unable and unfit to be king because he was controlled by his wife nur jaha and nur jaha survives 20 years after jahangir goes and shah jaha is, is is keeps a very close eye on her the entire time keeps her virtually uh, imprisoned in 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 lahore she plays no public role whatsoever after that um and this this idea i mean so much so the, is that the, there's even a painting from shah jaha's reign which has uh, akbar sitting in the middle and uh, there's uh, shah jahan to his left and and jahangir to his right and uh, you know akbar is sort of blithely handing the crown over to shah jahan while poor jahangir is sort of looking on like looking uh, very sullen <laughs> looking right? very sullen and little sad uh and this this was part of the sort of so these painters in shah jahan's time who were making all these paintings hmm. are kind of like the it cell of today right we have his <laughs> it cell which is pushing out these false narratives i guess <laughs> Yeah. and i guess another major work of that period which everyone refers to is of course abu fazal's uh, uh, you know histories of akbar yeah. which are fairly hagiographic and sure. he's just in awe of akbar and he also doesn't like jahangir very much so jahangir doesn't come across as very well and then though jahangir of course gives him the ultimate bad book review by <laughs> getting him beheaded and and throwing his head into a latrine in one of the colorful <laughs> details of Uh, sort of described in your book um, you've also uh, spoken in the past about how the way you looked at jahangir nama the book changed over time that at first you just looked at it as an honest diary that every day the guy is writing a diary but then you realized there was probably a little more to it than that that tell me a bit about that yeah so again for this again i'm indebted to uh, to corin lafever who uh, describes it as uh, as in an essay she calls it a model of imperial propaganda and uh, i you know because when you the first time you read it i i recommend it to everyone now having read it it's really very readable it's it's entertaining it's it's fluent it's lucid it's well written it's got it's got all kinds of emotions and you know action and adventure of all, of all sorts so so and and jahangir is a is a good writer and you know like good writers he can make you believe him as the narrator you know he makes you sympathetic to him and he makes you uh, be on his side but it doesn't mean that he was not aware that this was a public document and in fact at some point maybe about some by mid midway through his reign he has copies of the uh, of the jahangir nama that uh, the, as it exists then made and distributed to kings 
around the you know in the in the region and he says i sent it out and i meant it this jahangir nama to be a, a model of how to rule you know <laughs> so he 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 was just thinking of it in 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 those uh, terms and um, but all the human frailties that kind of come across like his drinking for example mm. and all of that i mean is that sort of slipping through the cracks of his uh, you know posturing as such or uh, does he feel that uh, uh, you know i mean how how convinced are you of this view of uh, you know having read both translations of the yeah. book how convinced am i you know i would say that let's say the drinking right he's talking he's talking about the drinking he's very uh seemingly very strangely frank about it you know he he says that i started drinking at 18 he tells the story in great detail he says i started drinking at 18 and i was out on a hunt and you know somebody got him just a little sort of pint or half a pint of sweet wine and he enjoyed it and uh, before you know it he's drinking you know 20 goblets of double distilled liquor a day 14 during the day and uh, the remainder at and night. then he goes on to elaborate that that's equivalent to six hindustani seeds which is equivalent to one and a half iranian mons and yeah. he's a scientific man of scientific measurement <laughs> man yeah he likes he likes to be clear and and then he says that i was drinking so much that uh, in my hangovers my hands used to shake so much that i couldn't even hold the goblet somebody else would have to pour the liquor down my throat and he says i i called the doctor and the doctor said to me that if you don't stop you'll be dead in uh, in 6 months and then he goes through his entire sort of de addiction program that was also done very meticulously yeah you know, where he reduces yeah. it bit by bit takes bit it down to 6 yeah and mixes his uh, spirit with wine like dilutes the oh. spirit with wine in order to <laughs> so that's how you give up drinking gentlemen dilute your spirits with wine <laughs> and have a little opium during the day hmm. to get you through so uh, on the one hand you know there's it it seems as if like oh okay if you look at it from a sort of a modern 21st century perspective it would appear like oh this is like a you know sort of a confessional narrative you know how i almost died from drink but then uh, rose to be emperor uh and again because i'm not a historian i don't want to say like too but i don't want to say things with too much authority but it's also like you know we're talking about the 17th century drinking is not perhaps or at least addiction to drink is is not viewed in the same way as it would be uh now you know there are there are problems with drinking then i mean there are there are sort of religious uh problems with it but the problem of addiction doesn't exist mm-hmm. perhaps in the way that uh, you know that it might let it perceive it now that, it that there is a stigma now. on yeah so perhaps you know when he's writing he's not writing against um uh, you know against a stigma or you know when he writes about uh, ordering the execution of the assassination of abul fazl uh, which he again writes with very frank and forthright way he said this guy was um, forever making snide remarks about me to my father so i, I knew i had to get rid of him so i asked uh, this beer singh bundela if he would kindly waylay him and uh, <laughs> and he did and he sent me his head mm. and uh, and he says it as if you know it's a sort of cold blooded murder really that he's ordered of and uh, you know man that he must have known for most of most of his life who was his father's like really one of his closest friends uh, and advisors so but again you know and i was, I was again discussing this with um, with anubhuti and uh, who said that you know again this could be a, a in a way you know is is he saying here that you know this is let's say in the 17th century if you are aiming to be king or you are an emperor the image that you project of yourself is of a man who will not let anyone stand between him and the throne a certain ruthlessness is necessary you know it is it has you have to be that and it's yeah. almost normalized so it's not even something that it seems remarkable and you know and we and, and we'll come to other uh, i want to ask you questions about couple of things you raise like drinking and addiction number 1 and number 2 about uh, the sort of uh, casual cruelty that can sometimes happen but you know let's kind of go back to the narrative and you, you know you start your book essentially with akbar mm. and a significant part of the story of jahangir is really the story of akbar wanting a son and and just to you know set some context we often think of you know when we 
uh, we look at history in a sense with a hindsight bias. It's happened. We take it for granted. We take it for granted that the Mughal Empire was this great empire that lasted mm. centuries. But as you've pointed out, uh, and as Ira Mukherjee spoke about in her episode with mm. me uh, a few weeks earlier, it wasn't such a done deal, you know. So Babur came over. You know, he was twelve when he ascended to his uh, uh, throne. He came over. He conquered a bit of it, but then they lost it. And Humayun was in exile for fifteen years. He was in fact in exile when he fell in love with Hamida Banu Begum mm. in Afghanistan, I think. And he asked for a hand, and she was like, "Who are you? You're, a, you know, you're uh, running right now. You're not a king." Mm. And anyway, so that kind of worked out, and Humayun comes back, and he's just taken over the kingdom, and then he dies. And Akbar ascends at fourteen, and the empire that he leaves, uh, that he, mm. Jahangir is born into, is just an awesome, incredible mm. empire. And Jahangir is a first son. There is no dynasty without at least one son coming along. So you've written in your book about how badly Jahangir desires uh, a son, and when he is born, you write, "Quote: There is only so much self-control a joyful father can have." Celebrations burst upon Agra like lightning upon a rain-ripe sky. Heaps and heaps of gold were scattered, says one writer. Prisoners in dungeons across the empire were set free. For days, poets composed odes to the prince. Stop quote, and and then you quote Abu Fazl um, Akbar's infamous biographer. Uh, quote: The auspicious birth of the world, illuminating pearl of the mansion of dominion and fortune, the night gleaming jewel of the casket of greatness and glory, namely of Prince Sultan Salim. Stop quote. So Akbar wanted the son so badly, and he loves mm. his son so much, mm. and yet there is such a sort of. Tension here because a son inevitably, no matter what he is, will be a disappointment to his father. I mean, not any son and any father, but you know, this was Akbar, yeah. So Akbar really, I mean, who could have not disappointed him? It's <laughs> not, you know, I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't have wanted to be in Salim's place. It was because this guy, like Akbar, really is extraordinary. You know, he is. I mean, there is a reason why he shines brighter than. Other people in in history, and there are some people like that who really uh, accomplish far more in one lifetime than most people could in in ten. You know, and, and there's no, I mean, when he becomes whatever, I mean, emperor, but emperor of what? You know, basically of of Delhi. He's not even in Delhi. He's still in Punjab. He's there's still he and Bairam Khan are still in pursuit of uh, Sikandar Sikandar Sur, and. Um, Humayun slips and falls and uh, uh, breaks his head, and and Akbar is suddenly king. But uh, but there's no reason for him to remain. There's loads of competition, and not least from uh, Himu, who is uh, one of the you know great generals of that time and has fought sort of several several battles and never lost one, and and is far more experienced and has a big huge army and lots of elephants, and he's uh, primed to take over. You know, and they face each other in in Panipat, and there, I mean, the battle, from you know whatever else I've read of it, it sort of it, it was a fairly equal battle. And then he does have a stroke of luck because uh, Hemu is uh, struck in the eye with an arrow, and he uh, and he falls. And uh, the logic of battles at the time was if the leader collapses. When the commander collapses, the army collapses. You know, which is really very inefficient. But that's how it was. So he, you know, so he collapsed, and so did the rest of uh, his army. And uh, and uh, so then, you know, that that battle is won, you know, partly by luck. Uh, but after that, it's not. I mean, luck doesn't get him through. You know, the next fifty odd years that he lives, and uh, goes from strength to strength to strength. Swat, swatting down rebellion after rebellion after rebellion. I mean, so many people are vying for power, and you know, not only is he doing that, not only is he increasing his physical geography of his realm, just sort of going from one conquest to another. He's also changing its systems. So when he's back from, you know, conquering Gujarat, and he sits down, he says, "Now let's rethink our revenue model, or our, you know, administration, or how we organize the mansabdars." He's very interested in all of that. Then he's also doing this. Uh, you know, he's got these great translation projects. He's got uh, building projects. He's got music and all of that. I mean, you know, so all so all of this is going on at the same time. This is a man who who. I mean, reading about him, you feel a little exhausted. 
You know, it's just he just never stops. Because I, it's, it's it, it must be like literally a one one in a millennium chance that all of these qualities converge upon one person. He he fits the role of the great conqueror. Mm. He's also a great public policy man to use uh, uh, modern uh, terminology where he is reforming his tax revenue systems and his mm. systems of governance and all of that. At the same time, he's a great patron of the arts, yes. partly with the help of all these painters whom Ayun brought back from Persia. Uh, famously and which but tradition which is Sanjahangir of course continues to great uh, with great success and also he is a serious intellectual he's thinking about religion all mm -hmm. of these different ideas mm -hmm. trying to mm -hmm. weave these strands together mm -hmm. and he finally has a son mm -hmm. and the son sits around drinking all day and examining animals mm -hmm. and shows no interest in conquest make keeps making excuses to kind of uh, I mean one of the themes that ran through your book is that your book is full of basically a father's sending a son to conquer something or the other quite often the Deccan and the son is making excuses and he's going here and he's going there and you know Akbar sends all his kids to do this and they all kind of make a mess of it and Jahangir then sends you know eventually Khurram has mm. a semi-success mm. um, of uh, uh, sorts and I, I, I was kind of Interested by the, you know, again, uh, just to talk a little bit about drinking and addiction, because as we were, you know, chatting while coming here, I was sort of a professional poker player for five years. I've uh, seen people uh, addicted to gambling. I've written uh, columns about uh, addiction and and it kind of, uh, and I'm, I'm again just thinking aloud and tell me what your response is, that I think a lot of people have addictive personalities but what they're addicted to is not specifically thing a or thing b or activity c it's dopamine to the brain mm. and the question is where do you get that dopamine from and in modern times it could be say from gambling you push chips forward you get dopamine rush to your head it could be from playing online chess which i think i might have been addicted to online chess or it could come largely from social media as well uh, in today's day and time where, you know, every notification gives you a hit, every like um, gives you a dopamine hit. But in uh, those times, like when I try to imagine how are people spending their time all day? Mm -hmm. Reading is not so common. There is mm -hmm. no television. There are no movies. There is perhaps, thankfully, no cricket or people mm -hmm. would be impaled. Umpires would be impaled upon <laughs> cricket fields. But there is a lot of wine and there's a lot of variety of mm -hmm. wine. So if people are going to get addicted, they mm -hmm. will get addicted to that. And mm -hmm. all of Akbar's children get addicted to it. You know, Murad and Daniel, mm -hmm. the other two kids, they kind of... Uh, so, you know, what sort of your response to that and also just thinking aloud, taking off from that, what's a typical day like in the life of, let's say, somebody living under Akbar or under Jahangir? Uh, you know, what are they doing? How are they spending their time? How do they... I mean, I know it's a very naive question which uh, historians can scoff uh, at me for asking. But... Well, to the first part, uh, well, sure, yeah, I mean, wine was plentifully obviously available and it wasn't just, you know, Akbar's sons who were addicted, but, you know, the the nobility generally and the sons of the nobility generally, like even, you know, Man Singh's son, I think he has, you know, sorry, four or five sons and of... Of that, I think at least two or three die of of drinking, and the you know Akbar Nama, Jahangir Nama, they are littered with accounts of uh, these sort of, in fact, littered with corpses of men who have perished from uh, from drink. But uh, I suppose there was also there were they have there were one or two alternatives. Hunting was one. Certainly, the Jahangir. You could almost say addicted to it. He does a census at one point, uh, asking, he wants to calculate uh, how many animals he's killed between the age of twelve and about fifty or so that he is when he orders the census, and the the amount comes to the rather obscene amount of about seventeen thousand one hundred and sixty seven animals. Out of which you mentioned that ten thousand are pigeons. Yes, I was very pleased to 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 learn this because it sort of uh, it makes me feel a little bit better. And eighty six, I think, were uh, were lions. Uh, so there was, uh, and at uh, least one snake, as we know, at least <laughs> if you count snake. that, and, the, and one rabbit, and one <laughs> rabbit, poor guy. Yeah. yeah. It could be argued that uh, the rabbit would have died anyway. Yeah, or maybe the rabbit escaped, or the rabbit fell out. I don't know. Yeah, the rabbit fell out of the. Rabbit fell out. Maybe the rabbit is the. Yeah, but a, a rabbit with severe post-traumatic stress disorder, yes. if it's gone yes. inside and outside. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, and so you know, definitely that. And I think the other thing, I mean, the Mughals do exhibit a sense or tendency, not just to, towards addiction, but to kind of, you know, obsessive, compulsive, sort of OCD type of behavior. Is when it comes to uh, record keeping, amongst other things, you know, they just everything is noted down, like in. In just uh, ridiculous detail, you know how uh, not just the contents of the treasury, but you know the, the 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 ranks of elephants, the ranks of mules, the you know uh, the different sort of guns in the artillery, the you know the, I mean every conceivable thing is noted down and filed. So um, you know, and and like there's one of these Englishmen who travels there. Uh, says that uh, everything that happens during the day in the emperor's life is written down by uh, writers, including what he eats, you know, and his his sort of going to the necessity. All all of that is sort of meticulously recorded. And it's and, interesting. You seem to be indicating that this is not just a matter of you know a good efficient practice that you record everything, but there's something obsessive compulsive about it. So again, would go back to the thing of this also creates hits of dopamine in yeah. some way. <laughs> just it seems to be because you like why would you go into such minute details of you know recording? There were and they, and it's very very professionally done. You know there I think there are. 14 record, recorders who work in shifts okay. over the course of, you know, uh, one week, two at a time, so that if one misses something out, the other one catches it. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a sort of professional, meticulous enterprise. Um, so, uh, so that would be another way of sort of getting the dopamine hits. Mm. Uh, so, but while, you know, the, the, the daily life of the emperor was recorded in such minute detail, Daily life of an ordinary person is more difficult uh, to imagine to access. Yeah, you know, I, you get glimpses. You know, you get glimpses of, uh, and let's say in the in the court, uh, when you know you have descriptions of how the court is um, arranged and how people come and uh, present their uh, uh, their grievances or their demands or you know what they. Uh, what they want you get you get you get glimpses of uh, the kind of gossip and talk that might be circulating in the towns or around the courts from some of these european writers and uh, i think i i particularly liked uh, what he said uh, thomas rowe is very shocked because he says that you know whenever jahangir makes a pronouncement the minute he said it it's um, he says it's available for every rascal on mm -hmm. the street to discuss and criticize and he says you know that that jahangir is really locked in this schedule that he has of his uh, uh, pre dawn appearance and his uh, you know the the, the public uh, uh, darbar and he says just as the people are his slaves so is he in a kind of reciprocal bondage uh with them, so he he can't deviate from his routine uh, very much. And the daily situation is there's a pre-dawn uh, sort of dish He comes out on the balcony and they mm. see him, much like Amitabh Bachchan today, mm, I guess. Yes, and then he takes a nap for two hours, and mm. then he'll have his breakfast and all that with whatever with opium, morning hit of opium. Possibly. And then he has two darbars a day. You yes. uh, you said one, you know, one before lunch, one after lunch, and it's it it all sounds. I mean, it would drive me to drink if I had to. <laughs> uh, uh, Work so hard. I I, I was also, uh, you know, struck by how, uh, you know, like you point out at um, uh, at one time that one of the most common lines in Jahangir Nama is "I summoned the painters," and and it, it almost strikes me that he's almost like uh, an Instagrammer, yeah. except a few centuries before yeah. uh, Instagram, so he can't whip out a smartphone and capture something. So whenever he wants to capture something, he'll do it the royal way, send for his painters and. Uh, you know, uh, a glacial pace uh, Instagram. And uh, you point to how the only life painting of a dodo really came from his coat, mm. which you reproduced in one of your talks. And it's a shockingly ugly bird. But <laughs> yes. what can one say of taste? Yeah. And you also point out, and the, 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 there's another painting that uh, 
uh, you know, you showed in one of your slide shows, which is on YouTube, which I encourage people to check out, uh, where uh, you showed this painting of this guy called Inayat Khan, mm. a guy who was basically fell very ill and was practically emaciated and, you know, literally bones jutting out and he comes to Jahangir and asks for leave or whatever and Jahangir says, fine, but first Instagram mm. and he summons a painter and, mm. and that painting seems very different from all other Mughal miniatures and all, it's almost like, like a Chittu Prashad painting of the Bengal famine, you know, mm. very stark and, mm. and this is how, when you were researching this, how did you sort of access the paintings? Like, how, how do you get context of what these paintings are and what's going on here? Uh, just like if, if one of the listeners of the show wants to do that for himself, sure. uh, is there a way to do that online? Yeah, 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 many of these are available online. If you look through, you know, through the museum, uh, many of the museums put up their collections online mm. to view. And uh, and also Jahangir talks about some of these things in the Jahangir Nama. So this Inayat Khan story he tells, mm. you know, so then you know that this, this painting exists. Then he talks about the zebra that comes to his court that he has uh, that he has painted and he's not sure if the stripes are real So you get someone not. to try and wash yeah, the stripes Yeah, try and off. wash them off. So, so, you, so you know that these paintings are, uh, are there. So yes, I mean, there are, there are hints in the Jahangir Nama itself. Then of course, you know, from reading other writers, modern writers who uh, talk about, particularly uh, Ebba Koch has written about, you know, art in, in Jahangir's time. Then there's a writer called Asfar Moin who's also done a lot of very, very interesting sort of close readings of certain paintings made during his time. But I agree with you that in Ayat Khan painting, for me also was quite both shocking in its content and in the fact that it, it is so different from anything that I have seen of, you know, there's something very sort of modern about it. You know, it, it seems very contemporary. It could have been made uh, and, and, and very haunting and very not beautiful. You know, and and the guy actually <laughs> died uh, shortly after the he painting. He died the day after or something. Mm. Yeah. Within a day or two, he died. So it is, it is really, it is a representation of death. And it's and it's absolutely real. There's no there's 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 no sort of prettification. Or there's no there's no soft edges. It's it's just his. Uh, another very sort of interesting and endearing quality of Jangir is sort of this endless curiosity about the natural world, which made me feel a little ashamed because. Uh, you know, I don't know if uh, it's true of you, but I feel jaded about a lot of things. The, the the wonder and awe of, you know, discovering new things and seeing something for the first time and just wondering how does that work? It's just not there in me anymore. And you'd imagine a Mughal emperor would be far more jaded. Yeah. And yet you have him uh, telling his uh, men to milk a lion <laughs> because he, he wants to see how that process is. You have the snake and the rabbit story. There's another story where he finds two different kinds of goats you pointed out mm. and he uh, gets them to mate because he wants to see what will come out of it. At the same time, using that, I'm sure they would be tasty. Mm. <laughs> Which is, And, uh, uh, you know, there's another story about how a dog gives bites an elephant and the mm. elephant dies of rabies mm. and Jahangir is like, mm. yeah, there's mm. something there, but he doesn't really explore it further but how can something so small mm. uh, attack something so big and uh, my, my uh, another story that actually ranks up there with the snake and the rabbit story as my favorite is a lion and the goat story mm. where uh, uh, Khusro's son the Warbucks gives him uh, you know a lion and a goat who are coexisting in a mm. cage and uh, he's curious about what kind of lion is this will mm. this work with any other goat he gets a goat taken out a lookalike goat is put in immediately killed puts in a sheep, immediately killed. And then the same goat is put back in and the lion treats it warmly and starts mm. cuddling up with it. Mm. Yeah, it's it's just amazing, the stories from his time. And yeah, he does that. I think his curiosity is one of the most endearing things about him. Without his curiosity, you know, he would be, he would not, because there, there are many, I mean, he has terrible, terrible cruelties and terrible uh, sort of, I mean, there are, there are many things about him that are not attractive. Yeah. But this, this his real appreciation of beauty and his boundless curiosity, like you said, really make him and his, make his Jahangir Nama both so compelling, you know, as both as a man and as a book. And so I think like in, in one sense, I suppose you get, you know, reading it, the other thing you realize is that the world was far less known at that time. You know, things were still new. You know, uh, I mean... 
uh, atlases and maps and globes were still like new things. And, uh, you know, there's this story and of uh, about uh, of a story, Thomas Rowe, in fact. And uh, at some point, Thomas Rowe presents Jahangir with an atlas. And um, at first, Jahangir is quite curious about it. And then he sends it back within a couple of days. And Thomas Rowe realizes that the reason he's done this is because, uh, you know, in, in those atlases, and even now in atlases as they're made, India appears much smaller than Europe, you know, so he doesn't doesn't like they don't like the idea of his his kingdom being smaller than any because he's he's the emperor of the of the world, you know. So 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 the world is not fully known. There's this um, there's this amazing little bit where uh, one of these other British Englishmen in his court is William Hawkins, who spent about four or five years. Uh, there and he uh, he's come his last voyage was in the West Indies and Jahangir says to him you know I've heard of the West Indies I wasn't sure if it was a real place you know I wasn't sure if it actually existed what is it and so you know so so he tells him all about it and even you forget Jahangir there's this Italian chap who's coming to India uh, Pietro de Laval and he's coming and on the way you know he talks about how he and the captain are discussing uh, unicorns and they're not discussing whether or not unicorns exist they're discussing on which latitude and longitude unicorns are found you know so, so the world is far more uh, wonderful in some ways and full of wonder than it is uh, today that if there's things still to be discovered. And that said, you know, it can also be very frustrating sometimes when you're reading, when you're reading about uh, Jahangir and his curiosities, because he, the curiosity stops and it, it stops almost as if there's this blind spot. You know, like the thing you mentioned about the the dog who gives, in fact, the elephant, right? And Jahangir's like, oh, how can such a small creature make such a large creature ill? And I just want to sort of shout out to him across the centuries. This is this is you know this is how uh, this is how infection works. You know this is this is malaria. This is but this there's is literally and no way he can have the intellectual tools. No, to... There's no way exactly. So you realize how how much has changed. You know how 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 easy it is for us to make that connection, and how almost impossible it is for him. Or, or even when, you know, there's another and another point of meteor meteor falls somewhere nearby in Jalandhar. And uh, and uh, and everyone is very excited of course and Jangir wants to see this this metal. But again there's this sort of curtain that falls. He's not you know, beyond sort of making some knives and uh, swords out of it, uh, there's no interrogation of what is this, where does it come from? You know, even though astrology and astronomy are both uh, sort of the highly developed uh, skills and passions at the time, the actual meteor falling, just some of you, it's there it is, you make your sword out of it and then it's finished. It's just a full stop. Yeah, in fact, you quote an Englishman named Henry Beveridge saying that Jahangir would have been a better and happier man as a head of a natural history museum rather than, you know, an imperial Emperor, tell me also about, I mean, I mean, you know, you live in Delhi mm. and uh, we keep talking about the air quality index of mm. Delhi and all that. How mm. many people know that Jahangir was one of the pioneers of air quality index? <laughs> tell me a bit about his yeah. efforts at measuring yeah. pollution in Gujarat. <laughs> yeah, so he went to Gujarat. He had been in Mandu for, for a while and he really enjoyed it. And uh, he then he was going up to Ahmedabad, and he'd heard a great great things about Ahmedabad. He'd you know he'd heard of um, he was looking forward to to going there. Uh, and he arrived, and immediately, almost immediately, he begins to complain. He said, "You know what is this place? It's a it's a dust heap." He calls it, and he says the air is just poisonous, and he uh, and he can't leave because there's a plague that's break broken out in 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 Agra, so he can't go back to Agra, and he's just more or less trapped. In Ahmedabad, he falls ill. Uh, he has to eat khichdi. He says, "I've not eaten khichdi since I was a child, and I really had hoped I would never have to eat it again." But here I am, and uh, and so he uh, so anyway to distract himself and to confirm his own theory, he orders this experiment. He has two sheep uh, skinned and hung up, one just outside Ahmedabad and one in Mahmudabad. Uh, and he has Mahmudabad in UP, of in course, UP, you know. yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, and so and the time how long it takes for the sheep to start rotting, and uh, and Jahangir is very right because the uh, the one in Ahmedabad starts to rot I think in eight hours or so, 
and the one in UP lasts uh, six hours longer. It lasts it 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 rots after fourteen hours. So the rotting so. sheep air quality index <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's quite and and uh, another bit nugget for my listeners. William Hawkins, who um, Parvati just mentioned, of course, invented the modern pressure cooker. I'm just kidding. He didn't. <laughs> Let's kind of, you know, you mentioned his cruelty earlier, and and uh, uh, a lot of it. And, and you know, at one hand, when it comes to animals, for example, of course, he has his curiosity. He killed the snake trying to make it eat a rabbit. But he also, for example, you mention how someone gives him an elephant, and it's night, and the elephant needs to be bathed, and he's feeling bad that oh, the water will be too cold, so the water is heated for the elephant to take a bath in. But on the other hand, he can be incredibly cruel. Like one example you point out is. um and we'll of course uh, you know talk about kusro and that whole politics later kusro is his elder son who rebels against him and he chases him and in fact you know while chasing him he makes sacrifices like he doesn't take his morning dose of opium he just runs off after kusro and then he reaches lahore where there is biryani spread out for him and he mm. notes in the jahangir nama that i would have loved to have the biryani but work awaits possibly mm. the only mm. such sacrifice he made in his career he has and, one white permit then he has to run and then he has to run uh, uh, after you know and so the the cruelty uh, you know the, the 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 great example that you know really struck with me and i was thinking about that was of khusro's lieutenant hussein beg and abdul rahim and i'll quote from your book here a uh, quote hussein beg and abdul rahim uh, this is after they've been captured and the rebellion has failed quote hussein beg and abdul rahim were wrapped naked in animal skin the badakhshi the hussein beg was stuffed into a freshly killed ox abdul rahim into a donkey and mounted backwards on asses they were paraded through the city hussein beg died of suffocation abdul rahim perhaps because donkey skin is more porous perhaps because he had supporters in the crowd who gave him water survived stop coat and this is one just in terms of imagination this seems crazy but what also made me sort of laugh out loud was that abdul rahim was later reinstated and jahangir would call him donkey <laughs> yeah <laughs> so and uh, you know and and the contrast to this is for uh, another place you mention about how he once caught fish and he released them back into the water with pearls pinned to their noses mm. why was this i god no he was the emperor he could do what he like <laughs> yeah. i i really don't know it just was that actually that was one of those moments that struck me you know as as uh, because pa- some of the reading of the jahangir and getting to sort of know him as much as is possible to you know uh, know so character from history was getting to know what it is to have almost limitless power you know and you and you start like asking yourself in the course of it like if i had this kind of power what would i do and would i not go a little mad you know and i think it would be almost impossible not to so uh, so if you have the power to release fish with pearls in their noses i suppose why not No, and there is there is also the sense, as you point out, that there are parts of the book where even Jahangir is surprised by the extent of his own power, such mm-hmm. as when he is in court and a supplicant comes and says that I want to marry this widow. Can you mm-hmm. please persuade her? And the guy says that I would jump from the highest tower to show my love. And Jahangir says, "Okay, jump from there." And he points mm-hmm. to a nearby thing, and the guy runs and he jumps and dies. And Jahangir is like, "What happened? What just happened?" Mm-hmm. You know, and mm-hmm. that is the power of the mm-hmm. emperor. So yeah. how can it? Uh, and and despite that, it. you know it's very hard one power because you know before he becomes emperor which is not a done deal and we've already sort of discussed about both how he murad and daniel the three brothers were disappointments to their father and mm-hmm. you know when he was pissed off at jahangir akbar looked at murad and then later murad died of drink and he looked at daniel and daniel also uh, died of drink in a fairly crazy uh, incident and then he turns to his grandchildren mm-hmm. and he looks at jahangir's uh, sons and in particular khusro is a person khusro is about 17 or 18 mm-hmm. at the time and he's thinking of propping him up and what's that rivalry like well i mean you know i i i i don't know but i can only imagine what it must have been like because again there are only hints you know for, for this uh like you know um, abul fazal says for example cryptically that the emperor always preferred his grandsons to his sons and uh, there's also you know just this is just a sort of stray fact that the akbar's grandsons called him shah baba you know mm. king father and uh, their father jahangir was shah bhai 
Ooh. looking brother. So, so this, uh, the, the sort of hierarchy was very clearly, you know, the power was very clearly flowing down from Akbar down to everyone below was sort of on, this, on a similar plane. And uh, so what it must have been like for, uh, for Jahangir, I mean, it certainly it couldn't have been easy to have, to know that, you know, your own son is preferred over you for the throne and uh, but it's uh, <clears throat> i mean it's not so much through through him that we get to see the, the what how much tension there must have been but through you know khosrow's poor mother who's uh, manbai uh, who's also man singh's uh, sister and jahangir's first wife and uh, at some point she uh, commits suicide she, she, she overdoses on opium and dies. And Jahangir writes about it again in the Jahangir Nama and he says uh, and he blames uh, Khusro. He says, you know, she was so upset with Khusro because he was behaving badly um, that uh, that she couldn't take it and she and she killed herself. And meanwhile in the Akbar Nama uh, the blame falls squarely on Jahangir because, you know, there the Akbar Nama says that uh, Jahangir treated her so badly uh, and upset her so much that uh, that she killed herself, and uh, and of course there's also the 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 the, the theory and the suggestion that uh, she and in the family there was a kind of um, manic depression that ran in the family. So you know she may also have been suffering from a depression of some sort. But still there there would you know there would have to be triggered, and uh, so it certainly can't have been fun. And in you know it's obviously an increasingly increasingly dysfunctional family. Your yeah. husband is fighting with your son who is backed by your father-in-law. Yes. For the throne, for the empire of all Hindustan. And just again, you know, as as uh, we learn from Thomas Rowe's writings, and I think William Hawkins, um, inventor of the pressure cooker, estimated that while the Mughal Empire was worth 56 million, England was half a million. Mm. So that was a difference. This was a mighty empire. There was a lot at stake. And also... Within Mughal dynasties, the way succession worked is it didn't automatically go to the eldest son like it does in some dynasties. You know, there weren't any rules like that. So it was up for grabs. Mm. And of course, in Akbar's times, it was relatively gentle. The worst you might do what uh, Jahangir at one point did to Khusro was blind him because blind people, according to Islam, cannot ascend the mm. throne. But Shah Jahan basically just killed off all mm. contenders. Mm. And, and that uh, sort of uh, became... Uh, more and more vicious. You know, one sort of counterfactual, if you'll uh, sort of uh, indulge me in this, is what I've always wondered is, one, it seems clear to me that uh, Khusro was admired and idolized by a lot of people, possibly seems to be have been a lot more powerful than Jahangir, and certainly had the support of all the women in the court, mm. all the sisters and mothers and aunts who are so powerful, and was respected by them, and feared by his own brother Khurram, the later Shah Jahan, who had him uh, sort of uh, put to death. And and Khusro, you could say, had numerous chances to ascend to the throne. One, directly after Akbar. Uh, or two, just as Jahangir's son, after Jahangir. And, um, uh, you know, he, he got like many second... Uh, there were many second acts in his mm -hmm. life. And none of them worked out. The counterfactual here is that what if Khusro does become emperor? Mm -hmm. And therefore, neither Jahangir nor Shah Jahan ever kind of become emperor. Is there a drastic difference to history? Or would you expect the rest of Indian history to proceed along? Perhaps indirectly what I'm asking you is what do you feel about, say, Thomas Carlyle's great man theory of history? Mm. Uh, which I assume you would say that, look, Akbar certainly was a great man. Mm. Without him, India's history mm. is completely different. Who could have built sure. this empire? But, um, uh, you know, I look at Khusro and I think that no one talks of Khusro. But he was so close mm. and had he gotten it, you know, Jahangir and Shah Jahan and therefore Aurangzeb later might never mm. have been emperors. Is that something you've thought about? I haven't thought much, although you can't help feeling sorry for Khusro if you read about him. Because he really does, he's, he's so close and he has such powerful support. I mean, he has the support probably, possibly, of his own grandfather, Akbar. And he certainly has the support of Man Singh, his uh, uncle, and his father-in-law, uh, Mirza Aziz Koka, who is uh, Akbar's one of his closest closest friends, advisors, and his foster brother. And Man Singh, of course, was a governor of Bengal and perhaps one of the best generals of the Mughal Empire. Mm, exactly. So, so, the, so he had this powerful backing. And then suddenly to have that snatched away 
and then to be so clear in your own mind that you deserve the throne more than your father does that you then within six months rebel uh, and you know he gets this he, he gets enough support and yet he has terrible luck and he clearly doesn't have as much experience in, in sort of leading a, a rebellion so he he's captured and as you said his his general meet these this sort of gruesome uh, punishment and the rest of them i mean you know he khosrow himself is made to ride on sort of an emaciated elephant through through the gates of lahore and on either side of him you know hundreds of his supporters are impaled so you know dying gruesomely on either side of the road as he walks marches past them and yet the same chap i mean obviously had some degree of charisma and appeal because within again a year or so maybe a few months he's managed to ferment another you know rebellion uh, which is when uh, sort of jahangir has him uh, blinded so even that is possibly was a reversible blinding you know because that some, you know, sort of the eyes the eyelids are sewn uh, together and then they can be opened uh, less convenient again. so yeah. if he changes his mind if he changes his mind yeah so they so so there's some accounts that say that he you know at some point he he was uh, he, he his eyes were opened again which is why he remained a threat to uh, to khurram you know otherwise if he had been really blind uh then uh, khurram need not have uh, no and one of one of the anecdotes which was really striking and which mm-hmm. made me think a little harder about khusro what kind of man he must have been mm-hmm. is that you point out that much later in life when you know noor jahan is a very uh, powerful figure and we'll mm-hmm. talk about that a little while later mm-hmm. but what essentially so she was married earlier to this guy called sher afghan i think mm-hmm. and she had a daughter through mm-hmm. sher afghan mm-hmm. and she was thinking of getting that daughter married to yes. khusro which would immediately make him a contender for Absolutely. the throne again Absolutely. and khusro refused mm-hmm. because he wanted to be loyal to his wife mm-hmm. and his wife said that no no Mm. this is good for you this mm. will finally get us out of the wilderness mm. you could be emperor mm. and he said no i'm not going to do it yeah and this blew my mind who does yeah. this you know yeah. when it's so common place yeah. for these guys to have yeah. multiple uh, sort of yeah although these are you these are this is a story that is told so you know it, it's possible he did it seems like very foolish of him if he did do that but it's also possible that he disliked noor jahan very much who knows you know maybe he didn't trust her maybe he didn't you know because it was uh, it was a difficult but uh, but or he just made the very wrong choice but but you know to come back to what you were saying about what would have happened if he yeah. had been if he so i don't know i think to me if you look at how the empire first grows and then sort of collapses upon itself uh you know succession is of course one part of it but and this idea that there is no primogeniture amongst the mughals so there isn't you know but there was it's not like there wasn't a system and the system would be to sort of divide the empire amongst yeah. different heirs and um, you know one of the most interesting things that i've been reading and reading about humayun a little bit in the last few months and uh, you know there is this suggestion that towards the end of his reign babur was beginning to feel about humayun very much as uh, akbar was feeling about jahangir mm-hmm. that this chap was not up to it you know that so he didn't want to he was anyway he had passed out i think he had given kabul to kamran and i think perhaps lahore and punjab to askari and he was he wanted to send uh, humayun to badakhshan Mm-hmm. but when he was posted that he was not supposed to be in in delhi and delhi and agra would go to babar's brother in law uh who was married to his sister khanzada begum who is one of the most memorable characters in in the in that family and uh, she he was very close to her so the suggestion is that in fact he was going to make his sister in a sense the de facto empress the, the empress or empress of this part mm-hmm. of the empire you know and then they would sort of uh and then even under akbar when akbar uh, becomes emperor of whatever little bit omayu has managed to get back his younger brother uh, muhammad hakim is in kabul and he is sort of he and his mother are the rulers of kabul and kabul remains a kind of autonomous region even though you know hakim rebels once or twice and akbar sends in an army but until he dies uh akbar doesn't make kabul into one of you know part of the empire uh but then you know the empire just expands and expands and expands and so then does the uh the lure of it 
you know so so by the time you come to shah jahan and then to to aurangzeb the stakes are so high uh, that uh, and the, the, the greed also then you know it, 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 it multiplies by leaps and bounds and so does the uh, venality and the murderous impulses so uh, so you know unless khusru had lost the empire and they had to begin again from scratch if he had been what as successful as as jahangir was and and there's no it's not necessary that he might or might not have been because jahangir i don't think would have taken it lying down and he would have had a he did have a very strong uh, uh, support you know and he would have he would have attracted support also he was not bad at creating alliances and 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 drawing people to him in fact one of the interesting things that uh, you know after he won the battle of success, succession which I'll, uh, uh, ask you but one of the things he did was he forgave many of the people mm. who were against him mm. you know almost like uh, you know lincoln and the team of rival singhs mm. where uh, uh, you know he forgave all these people even in the example of you know abdul rahim who was stuffed in donkey skin mm. and paraded through mm. but ultimately back in the uh, court so mm. he was obviously a very interesting kind of statesman he wasn't completely incompetent he was mm. making his sort of alliances and stuff mm. L- let's take a quick commercial break now and we'll come back after that and talk more about the fascinating life of emperor jahangir Hey everybody, welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you are not following us on social media, why the hell aren't you? It's about time that you did. We're IVM Podcast on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. We also got some really great news about Pesa Vesa. Anupam Gupta, our host, we couldn't be prouder of him. His show has won the award for the best business podcast at the Asia Podcast Summit. Couldn't be happier, couldn't be prouder. Definitely check it out if you haven't heard it. It is an award-winning podcast now officially. I also would like to thank our sponsors this week, Storytel and Intel. Sponsors make this possible, so please support our sponsors, tweet at them, tell them that you're happy that they're sponsoring the podcasting space. We're excited to announce our new show Storytellers and Story Sellers hosted by Vineet Kanabar. Every episode he talks to two guests, one from the creative side and one from the business side of the entertainment industry. This week Vineet is joined by executive creative director of TVF and storyteller Saurabh Khanna and chief strategy officer of OML and story seller Tarun Tripathi. Together they break down what goes into making a branded web series. Tune into new episodes every Thursday. On Cyrus says Cyrus is joined by Utsav Memoria. Utsav is the host of our new show and one of my favorites on the network Postcards from Nowhere. He and Cyrus have a really interesting conversation about Utsav's fandom of Cyrus. Also they talk a lot about about travel and Utsav's recent marriage. Two of our shows reached their 50th episode this week. On Pulia Bazi Pranay and Saurabh talked to Nidhi Gupta who researches and teaches behavioral economics. They discuss insights from Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman's classic Thinking Fast and Slow. And on the 50th episode of Paperback, Rachita and Satyajit talked to the best-selling author Ashwin Sanghi about his perspectives on mythology, history, and writing historical fiction. On the Filter Coffee podcast, Karthik is joined by CEO and Managing Director of Fireworks, Sunil Nair. Sunil shares his insights about Fireworks technology, his time at Alt Balaji, and differentiates advertising for an OTT platform versus television. On Advertising is Dead, Varun is joined by Tess Joseph, a renowned casting director. They talk about her journey in the film industry. On Mr. and Mrs. Binge Watch, Janice and Anirudh discuss the pros and cons of the newly launched Apple TV Plus service and review some flagship shows on the platform. This week on Edges and Sledges, Ashwin, Varun and DJ talk about the first India vs. Bangladesh test and IPL transfers. On GBCD, Sunetra and Farah talk about how they face discrimination as kids for choosing to do things against gender norms. On Postcards from Nowhere, Utsav, who is on Cyrus this week if you have forgotten, talks about witnessing Kerala's famous martial art, Kelari Pattu. And with that, let's get you on with your show. Welcome back to the scene in the unseen I'm chatting with Parvati Sharma the author of a, an entertaining biography of Jahangir and entertaining why not just because of the delightful style of her writing but also because history is entertaining these are incredible stories you can't make this shit up uh, you know while we were at the break you sort of um, told me that um, you know you went back to my earlier question about how ordinary people lived in the Mughal empire because what do they do they can't get up in the morning and look at their smartphone and complain about the battery so so tell me a bit about uh, uh, you know uh, what um, f- insights you gained on that from reading the literature of this period yeah, no so there was you know and it wasn't so much insight as just these sometimes these really vivid glimpses of moments in everyday life you know and um, you know amongst them for example and many of them come from the the sort of european writers because they are the ones who you know recording what it is 
uh, to live every day or to uh, the sites that they see for their audiences back home. So, uh, you know, somebody, one of them very bitterly, in fact, writes about how, you know, people in some village, he sees uh, women and children wearing necklaces of, of cloves, you know, because cloves are so, so, so cheap here. And this poor man, uh, is trying to, uh, he, he's a Dutch trader and he's bringing spices from uh, the Spice Islands to India. But, you know, he's not able to make very much money for what he uh, brings. And he has to spend more than he has on what he needs to buy. Or you have, you know, another another writer who arrives in, in Gujarat. So he's writing about uh, Kambay and then about Surat. And he presents this very dynamic view of these, you know, um, bustling cities with uh, these bullock carts racing through the streets with you know the bells on the on the necks of the of the of the bulls ringing loudly to to alert everyone he talks about uh, hospital animal hospitals you know in hospital i mean obviously for larger animals like gaushalas and all but also mm. hospitals for for mice and for birds and oh. you know and um, and he presents also this you know picture of of you know tanks built at regular intervals as, you know, water or, or access to water is something that is provided as a philanthropic act by the richer people in a town or a city. And also, you know, you know what, what, what also, you know, so what struck me was uh, how they talk about, mm, well, how they talk about religious freedom, because, you know, they all, almost all of them say that there's an extraordinary uh, as one of as Pietro de Laval says, an extraordinary liberty of conscience in the realm of the Mughal. That's a lovely and phrase, liberty. It of is, I know, and it, it sounds very, you know, twentieth, twenty-first century. It sounds like, uh, but uh, you see, people, are, anyone is free to practice not only to practice whatever religion they wish to, but also to criticize uh, the other, you know. And and these are people who are coming from very sectarian. Europe where people are killing each other, you know, for, for differences of sect, let alone uh, religion. And so they're all very surprised to see what's going on here. But they also, clearly defining it, they also notice this idea of purity that runs through uh, the India that they see and, uh, you know, of, of, of castes. And so there's a young, there's an Englishman who comes uh, while Thomas Rowe is here and he has this great idea of building public water supply in Agra. And Thomas Rowe is really scathing and he says, this guy is, I mean, and you know, what what kind of stupid plan is this? Because nobody will drink water that is not fetched by his own caste. You can't have public water flowing like this because nobody will touch it. And uh, this Pietro de Laval, in fact, is in his, his sort of expat community, are so uh, fascinated by this idea of, pure and impure touch that they improvise a little drinking game where, you know, everyone is to drink their wine uh, in the Indian fashion without touching the uh, the cup to the lip. And whoever uh, spills it then uh, loses, I suppose. <laughs> and everyone laughs. So, uh, so you get, uh, and one of the things that you get actually from, from Jahangir, and it was, it was to me really surprisingly vivid, image was, you know, he's he's also traveling in Gujarat and uh, he says the roads are lined with these sort of uh, waste level um, shelves, you know, and uh, and he says that they're, they're, they're there so because porters, because there's so much trade, so porters uh, can rest their load on that shelf without having to take off the, the load from their back. It seemed like a very um, clever uh, and considerate uh, idea, you know, so, so, uh, so yeah, so there are these, so, uh, very in fact, nice when I, uh, you know, uh, read your book and uh, read this bit about Gujarat and mm. the porters relieving themselves, I was reminded of a tweet a few months back, I forget by whom, uh, I vaguely seem to think it's one of the journalists who works at the Hindu, but I'm not very sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but the tweet basically had a picture of this big shelf like thing somewhere in Tamil Nadu. Mm -hmm. And saying, do you know what this is for? And no one in the area, no, no one's really seemed to have an right. idea what it was for. And right. the purpose was for labor of women who are carrying things on the head, right, right, they right, can right. rest it there. So it's at a slightly oh. higher height than these shelves would be. Uh -huh. And because no one does that anymore, yeah. thankfully we have progressed beyond that. Yeah. 
uh, no one knows what these things are. They're like <laughs> artifacts, like you know, yeah. like uh, like a trivial Stonehenge yeah. in a sense. Like, <laughs> oh, what is this for? Right. But now we know what that's for, and just knowing what it's for also gives you an image of sort what kind of. Uh, life must have been like you know you were mentioning sort of religious freedoms and all that and of course your book has a, a section on how uh, for example the Mughals attitude towards Sati mm. which is that they disapproved of it mm. uh, but they didn't want to outlaw it entirely mm. so the instruction that Jahangir gave to his governors mm. was that you talk to the woman concerned in every mm. case offer her inducements tell her we'll give her a pension or look after her mm. and only when you're absolutely sure is of her own free will then what do you do you have mm. to let it uh, mm. kind of proceed Seed. But religion also brings me to the circumstances of his rebellion and eventually taking over. Mm. The rebellion, of course, is very funny in the sense Akbar sends uh, Murad is dead by now, I think. Mm. So Daniyal is uh, looking after Allahabad. Mm. And um, uh, you mentioned how Akbar sends him to the Deccan, which is this constant sort of uh, humorous uh, uh, leet motif of uh, uh, this. and he sends him to Deccan and um, uh, Daniyal is messing up there so Akbar goes after him and uh, at this point Jahangir is sent on another campaign with Man Singh mm. but Man Singh has an emergency in Bengal where mm. he is governor so he leaves and uh, Prince Salim as he then is mm. surrounded by his hangers on decides to make a play for power takes okay. his army to Agra what happens next? <laughs> <laughs> takes his army to Agra and is confronted by the by Kilich Khan for a man unenviable position because he has to hold and and uh, Jahangir and Salim's idea is to raid the treasury so Kilich Khan has to ho- keep Akbar's treasury safe while also not you know losing his own head uh, to Jahangir's uh, well-known temper so, uh, which he is doing, sort of, he's sort of, he's, he's sort of negotiating and saying, like, you know, standing firm, not letting Jahangir in. But who knows how things would have gone, except luckily for Kilich Khan, Jahangir's grandmother, Hamida Banu Begum, hears about this, and she happens to be in Agra, and she's, she's just uh, very shocked and dismayed, and she, she sends word to say, what are you, what are you doing? And I'm coming to see you, and Jahangir uh, is so embarrassed. Uh, this idea and doesn't want to can't face his grandmother, so he quickly gets on a on a boat and sails off to Allahabad, which is luckily uh, vacant since Daniel is uh, <laughs> <laughs> gone. Yeah, and he takes that. The, the sort of the interesting uh, political economy angle behind Jahangir eventually winning the succession battle against Khosrow also was that. You know, Mansing and Aziz Koka, of course, supported Khosrow, as you said earlier. But the mistake they made, and we can only say it's a mistake in retrospect, is that rather than just announce him emperor and then try to, uh, you know, work around that, they order sort of a council mm. of statesmen and elders to mm. decide on the issue. Mm. And they're a powerful faction of, um, uh, a powerful Sunni faction, support Salim, and mm. eventually he ascends to the mm. throne. How much... Uh, like, what is the interplay happening here? Are these sort of traditional Sunni figures pissed off at Akbar because of, you know, all of Akbar's mm. uh, syncretic, secularizing mm. uh, sort of activities? And they're like, no, we must preserve our faith and that, you know, and Khusro is Akbar's chosen one. So mm. we will go for Salim. Mm. Is that, uh, is religion an angle in all of this? Religion is certainly an angle in all of this. Akbar has pissed off uh, the conservative, particularly the Sunni Muslims in and around his court, uh, because he has not, um, of course, for his many heresies, uh, he has proclaimed a whole new religion. You know, forget, uh, so he's, you know, see the, the the rumors abound that he has forsaken Islam, that he's not Muslim anymore, um, and. Um, uh, so, so, so people are not, and he, and he's taken away not just that, but he's also taken away power from the uh, the clerics, you know, who had a great deal of power in uh, in previous courts. Uh, so they're not happy and Jahangir is very much playing to this gallery. So while he's sitting in uh, Allahabad holding his rebel court, he's also issuing, you know, fatwas once in a while saying mm-hmm. that my father, what he's doing is very bad, very bad and... Uh, and clearly indicating that he will not do this when he uh, when he becomes emperor. So he does have that. Uh, he does have that support. And uh, but um, that said, 
It's you know things get very so so um, so I don't if you don't if you don't mind I'll give you sort of slightly Please, sort yeah, of yeah, huh, yeah. tangential answer or digressing but you know that it's interesting to me one of the things I thought while while sort of writing and thinking about this book I mean we 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 think of the Mughals particularly uh, you know I mean think all historical characters as we know them perhaps because we have so many or perhaps because. of the way that we have understood our own history are thought of in sort of black and white bullet point terms you know and and with the mughals uh, that black and white bullet point tends to focus on this uh, sort of secularism and communalism you know and and therefore the greatest amount of uh, writing thinking debating goes on about this you know supposedly secular hero that is akbar and this communal villain who is uh, aurangzeb and regardless of whether you know secular or communal words that even make any sense in the you know in the 16th and 17th uh, centuries this is how we understand them and even if we are trying to sort of rethink those categories it's difficult to get out of that trap you know either you're saying oh no he was secular or no he wasn't or secular is not the right word but we somehow the, those those words have to or you know he was or was not communal but that, that those words keep coming and, and just thinking aloud uh, doesn't this tendency of thinking in <coughs> these stark binaries carry on to the present day where we talk of nehru or ambedkar or gandhi who, or even mm-hmm. savarkar who are all deeply mm-hmm. complex figures mm-hmm. and you know cannot be pinned down mm-hmm. into black and white and and yeah. uh, that's how people make sense of the world and which is why we need historians <laughs> <laughs> and that possibly ties into the great man theory too mm. you know men are either you know the the great men of history are either great greatly good or greatly bad mm. and uh, and that's how they you know that's how we we understand them but the interesting thing and the nice thing about jahangir is because he has no i mean nobody is thinking of him as a great man of any kind and so he doesn't have this kind of there's no pressure you know so when you read his life you can uh, read it with a lot more detachment and see how it, he wasn't just this or that but he was this and also this and also this and also this and also this you know he was all kinds of uh things so i guess one of the things i mean post uh, khosrow's rebellion but because of it early on in his career is one of the i suppose if you were thinking of jahangir in in, in purely religious terms one big blot on his career would be the execution of guru arjun dev uh but once you start looking at it you know it, that that story yields many kind of possible interpretations and uh so one of course is that jahangir talks about it again in the jahangir nama is quite clear and there isn't any hint of there being any religious angle to it i mean until then guru arjan dev and and the gurus and the moguls had fairly decent relationship guru arjan dev himself specifically and an akbar had met uh, and got along and akbar had uh given him a grant and enjoyed talking to him and all that and perhaps because of this reason uh husro when he rebelled uh he was on his way to lahore and on the way he stopped at the guru's hermitage and uh, the guru blessed him and maybe he gave him some money which is not entirely clear uh and later on jahangir finds out about this and he has him he says i had him uh, i had his property confiscated and i had him executed right but it doesn't seem at all as if this was anything more than a political act on the other hand it's also possible that jahangir was in some ways goaded to do this by his advisors who would amongst them uh, you know a number some of these sunni uh, uh, clerics who would have by you know because by this time sikhism had sort of evolving as a religion and guru, the the guru was attracting more and more followers both hindus and uh, muslims and thereby being a political <laughs> threat as well as much yeah as, exactly yeah. being a political and a religious uh, threat to to his to jahangir's mullahs not to jahangir himself so it's possible you know that that was also happening and and there's a, there's another story not of another uh, religious man who who uh, who dies because of jahangir shustri so yeah shustri yeah and i really like this story because he's you know so he's a shia and he uh, and he's an old man by this time and at some point about 1610 or so jahangir has him whipped and then he um, soon after he dies most likely as a consequence and there's this chap called sajad rizvi who has a fantastic essay on all the wheels within wheels within wheels that are going on here you know and it so 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 rizvi says that it's you know possible that shushtri was pretending not to be 
Shia because of the sort of growing uh, Sunni influence in the court. It was uh, he thought it was good idea to, to do that, and uh, Jahangir has him whipped, uh, not because uh, he is Shia, but because he is pretending not to be, and by that pretense he is casting an aspersion on. Uh, Jahangir's uh, liberality and Jahangir says also that he's making me look like a coarse and bigoted man and you know how dare he cast this expression of bigotry on me and yet you know uh, this Sajjad Rizvi goes on that it's also quite possible that it was that sectarian Sunni court that had it in for this old poor old Shia man and uh, again sort of arm twisted the emperor into having him whipped but Jahangir could not admit this because in his own sense of himself, uh, there is no, um, there is forget bigotry or tolerance. There is very little religious uh, sense. And uh, Thomas Rowe puts it very well. You know, Thomas Rowe says that he has been bred up without any religion, and and it was easy for me also to identify. And I think that you know there are many people who. So I have. You know, my father is Hindu, my mother is Sikh, neither was particularly religious. So, you know, when you're brought up without any kind of religion, you, yeah, I know, I know what that, you know, what that, what that means. And and then Thomas Rowe continues that so therefore he's either the easiest man to convert or the most difficult because he is willing to listen uh, to everything, but he won't believe anything. You know, he doesn't have that uh, that ability to have religious faith. You know, so he's. Um, uh, He'll watch the stripes of the zebra. Yes, yes, exactly. The, the Shusuri know. story was so mind blowing because, you know, when I heard about it uh, and uh, from you, um, it it was uh, because it is almost Rashomonic hmm. in its multiple points yes. of views and its multiple yes. pretenses. Yes. That uh, at the surface level, Jahangir's uh, uh, claim is that uh, I don't care whether he's Shia or Sunni, but the fact that he pretended was an affront to my liberalism and therefore that pretense deserves a punishment of death but on the other hand you point out the possibility that um, it was under pressure from the Sunni so mm -hmm. he's pretending to be loyal to the Sunni faction who he needs for political reasons and on the other hand there is that he then needs to pretend perhaps to himself perhaps to the world mm -hmm. that this is not the reason that mm -hmm. he actually is liberal so it's mm -hmm. layers within layers and it seems like you know if there's an Indian Kurosawa this is <laughs> such an incredible yeah. I mean your book is full of incredible subjects of the sort for novels of film or whatever mm -hmm. it, it's just uh, fairly mind-boggling to me but uh, you know uh, another interesting aspect of mm -hmm. his sort of uh, uh, religious leanings and his sort of experiments is, is this interesting guy called Jadrup Gosain mm -hmm. that, who is Jadrup Gosain he, he's not a Muslim so what Jadrup Gosain no Jadrup Gosain is very much not a Muslim he's a he's a very uh, he's a he's sort of a Brahmin saint and uh, ascetic and uh, Akbar first finds him and then uh, Jahangir goes to visit him. First he meets him in a cave near Ujjain. And uh, Jahangir is just just amazed by his asceticism and, and you know, the, his frugality. And he, you know, he, he eats like three mouthfuls a day and he lives his entire life inside this tiny little cave. And Jahangir has it measured, of course. It's barely possible for a man to get inside. And Jahangir goes to meet him and he meets him in private. And there's even a painting of that shows, you know, the Jadrup Gosen and, and Jahangir talking outside the cave and all the nobility uh, very much on the fringes of that painting, and he and he does this more than once in the Jahangir Nama, and he meets him and he has, uh, he has very long, very detailed and clearly fulfilling conversations because he says, you know, I mean, uh, after one of them, he says that you know I was very, I was very happy to meet him and I was very sad to, to part from him, and clearly this man also had some influence over Jahangir because there's an essay by him. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a thing, maybe Shireen Musfi has written this essay about um, how at some point, you know, poor Khusro is in uh, in jail or in, in captivity, but occasionally he is allowed more freedom than at other times, you know. So so at, at some point uh, you hear in Jahangir Nama, he says that I, I let Khusro come to meet me every day. And it seems that it may have been that, uh, you know, Fosro's father-in-law, Aziz Koka, went to Jadrup Kosen and said, you know, could you please intercede on his behalf and let him sort of move around a little. So he had, you know, he had that kind of influence on Jahangir. And and this idea, and the, 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 you know, this, this sort of ascetic 
the idea of asceticism itself seems to have been something that attracted him. In fact, there's uh, even a painting of him where he's all. like a bare chest exactly. and you know sitting with exactly wearing a dhoti and yeah. and, and and sitting in this sort of ascetic pose. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking aloud, and I could be completely wrong, but it seems to me just listening to both what you've said about his sort of religious quest, as it were, and also his curiosity about the natural world, such as a dog biting the elephant. It seems to me that the curiosity itself is intense and genuine, but the quest is kind of shallow, and that's not necessarily his fault because he is also limited. by the tools at his disposal while well, you can say that for someone like akbar for example in the context of religion mm-hmm. it would seem that the you know both the impulse and the quest itself was mm-hmm. deep and genuine you know he's mm-hmm. actually going and meeting arjun dev and chatting with him he's writing up to the neela he mm-hmm. and uh, uh, for, for jahangir it's like he just falls short in both those areas does that make sense it, that it could but also here i have to admit to my own inability you know one inability have not being a historian and therefore not being um, i mean i don't have the languages i have just english so i can't read in persian i can't read in other and other, other languages and there is this text called the majlis e jahangiri uh, which records some years of jahangir's evening conversations you know it's it, it's interesting because i think it is asfar moin perhaps who pointed this out uh, that uh, you know um, I mean, many people say that, for example, in the Jahangir Nama, there is no mention of Thomas Rowe, mm. right? And that can be taken as a mark of how insignificant Thomas Rowe was. But it's also possible. This is what uh, Moin I think says that uh, in the Jahangir Nama, Jahangir is writing about his days, but not about his. nights the evenings are when he has these conversations with people both the spiritual religious conversations and the conversation with ambassadors and visitors and all that and some of that is uh, it I means not recorded by him but there is this this record by another visitor to his court who records some of these uh, religious conversations that he has with various uh, clerics and uh, priests who come to his court so uh, now i don't know you know i've only that i've only been able to it's not been translated so i've only seen a little bit here and there quoted in essays but it's possible that that reveals uh, a, a deeper a, quest a deeper quest i mean you know or at least a deeper interest in these matters he does uh, you know he does it seems you know so so akbar has um, this idea of sulekul right the peace for all which becomes a kind of motto for his reign and uh, jahangir according to little extracts from this book describes himself as mazari kul which translates as a sort of universal manifestation he says that you know the way that um um uh, god takes care of all his slaves so i take care of all god's slaves you know so his own idea of what religion means of what it means to rule over different religions um i i i don't know how how deep or sophisticated they were but they perhaps are more than we we can gather only from the jahangir now and his instinct <laughs> seem to be fairly liberal as we would call it today oh so thomas row has this uh, there's a little bit in thomas row where he he talks about how he uh, you know at some point jahangir is in in his, in his cups and he starts talking about uh liberality towards all religions and thomas rose says he, he sort of starts crying because he's so moved by his own <laughs> his, you know good intentions yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah so that that uh, that idea uh, was certainly and you know because he is a product himself of so much uh, intermingling you know he is uh, he has a hindu mother he has a hindu mother he he has lived his entire life in hindustan you know he, this is his country and uh and to me the, the 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 you know the most telling thing is his taste in fruit you know so you have you have babar who comes here and he for the very few years that he's here he's really missing his melons he even literally cries when a when a shipment of melons arrives in agra from kabul he can't believe it and modern nationalists would find more reason to dislike babar because he also says bad things about mangoes yeah. he says okay. mangoes are okay okay yeah. he says they're do but they're mm. no when yeah they're not they're, melons they're not melons Uh, and then uh, jahangir at the beginning of his reign goes to kabul and almost like it's like a mirror 
effect. You know, he says almost exactly the opposite. He says that all the, the fruits are very nice. In Kabul, he has some cherries, he has some peaches, he has apricots, uh, melons. You know, he says the fruits are all very well, but he says nothing can match a mango. And, and this is this is really interesting, and actually, a, you know, question I was saving for the end of the episode, but I'll ask you now is this gradual journey where what is essentially a Timurid dynasty, a Timurid people, they bring their languages with them, their, uh, uh, you know, their harems and all the women and whatever, and and gradually what happens is that one they get more and more Hindu because if you think about it, Jahangir is half Hindu, mm. and his sons even more than that because some mm. of his wives are, uh, mm. you know, Rajput princesses or whatever, mm. and not only are they in terms of their bloodline and so on getting more and more Hindu and more and more Indian rather uh, but even culturally they're losing those old languages they're losing those sort of uh, old um, ways and it would seem that it's you know around this time that you know that with Jahangi that line is drawn that they are now an Indian dynasty that the past is behind them that you know wherever they came from Uzbekistan or whatever hmm. it's, it's, it's in the past yeah, this idea that, you know, one day we will conquer Samarkand remains, mm. I think, uh, certainly all the way up to uh, Aurangzeb, but it remains really as an idea, you know, that, 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 lip, that service. Bump, lip service, although they try, I, mean, I think there's some disastrous campaign that Aurangzeb is sent off on by Shah Jahan. but it, it's, it's not, but I mean, for Babur, that was it, that was all he wanted was to be king of Samarkand, that, that was home and that was, that was his ultimate ambition. You know, that was Timur's capital and that was the that was what he wanted to be. Uh, In fact, I, I was just reminded by another TIL moment which quizzers would like, which I got from your book, which is about the origin of the word Vilayat. Mm. And you point mm. out how, uh, you know, the, the, the term originally means home. Mm. And it was, um, you know, Jahangir Seret of Kabul or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jahangir Seret of Kabul mm. and he meant it as home. Mm. But over time, it has come to mean the opposite. Yeah. Exactly. I, I was also quite taken aback by that. It meant sort of homeland or the land of the, yeah. you know, ancestors. And it has, the meaning has completely turned, uh, and it turned around. it kind of depends on who you, like, for example, if an Englishman uses it of England, he is mm. talking of England as his vilayat, his mm. home. Mm. But then when an Indian starts calling it vilayat, mm. picking up from him, mm. the meaning changes exactly. and somehow that new meaning becomes. Exactly. The real, oh, the, the real meaning. And, and that, that will just... You know, so so fascinating to me. Let's the the, the kind of the really fast. One thing I learned recently uh, about the Mughals and it's really fa fascinated me. And I did an episode on Ira Mukherjee with it mm. on her um, excellent book, Daughters of the Sun. Is about the women, the, the Mughal women. And even in your book, there is a very prominent role played by uh, the women, starting with Hamida Banu Begum, of mm. course, Akbar's mother, mm. Humayun's bride from Afghanistan, who is. Uh, uh, you know who Jahangir is so scared of that when she says, "I'm, you know, I'm coming to see what the hell you are doing, trying to rob the treasury," he runs off to Allahabad. And later, one of the sort of things that really struck me about the legendary Nur Jahan is that again, you've pointed out that being an emperor, Jahangir could have any woman he wanted. And what he chose, uh, who he fell in love with and stayed so loyal with and built this enduring friendship and partnership mm. with, was a widow in her mid-30s. Mm. Uh, and, and, and this the, the whole attitude towards women, the way they uh, revere and respect the uh, women, um, you know, in their palaces and, mm. and, and how much they listen to them. Mm. Tell me a little bit about that, I mean. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the, the more I read about... The Mughals and their sort of extended families, the more sort of uh, these very strong women come out, you know, they're just, they're all over the, the, the place. Uh, Babar, you know, in his Babar Nama writes about his grandmother as being one of the most uh, important influences on his life and not just, you know, as grandmother, but also as actually advisor on military matters and strategic matters. Because he he's to, 12 when he stayed. Yes, with her. exactly. And, and he goes to her and she advises him on what to, uh, what to do and how to do it. So, and his sister Khanzada is, is very much, I think, in fact, Ira talks about it in, in, yeah. her, in her book. There's, there's a painting she has in her book in which Khanzada is, is part of a council, you know, and she's, I think she's, She's the biggest figure in that council. You know, she's, she's clearly the most important person in that in that council. Uh, then there are, you know, there are so there are others. There's the Salima Sultan Begum, who's uh, Bairam Khan's 
wife and later Akbar's wife, then Gulbadan Begum, who is Akbar's aunt, and on all of these people play a very strong, important role in Jahangir's life. There's also Hamida Banu is 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 only one of Humayun's wives, and Humayun has at least three. Who are you know that's mm. fairly rare for three wives to uh, sort of remain known in history for fairly big accomplishments one is uh, you know the haji begum his his first wife she is she builds the humayun's tomb then there's uh, you know hamida banu who uh, you know first resists his overtures for 40 days 40 days it takes of him wooing her uh, and um, one of his stepmothers finally persuades hamida banu with that eternal argument that has been used to persuade uh, you know women to marry she says that you know you have to marry someone so why not him as well as anyone else and he is so, a fugitive right now mind <laughs> you not an emperor i think shade sa story is basically ruling uh, yeah, yeah, what yeah, we yeah, call yeah, india yeah, 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 is there is in fairly bad straits and the straits will become much worse very soon mm-hmm. but uh, so his third wife uh, ma chuchak begum who is youngest her youngest wife who is also the mother of akbar's young half brother uh, mohammad hakim and is the de facto ruler of uh, of kabul. of kabul and uh, you know battles uh, when akbar sends one of his governors there she throws him out and goes to battle with him and defeats him you know uh, so uh, so th- so th- so there are many examples of very very strong women uh, in the life of jahangir and jahangir himself is indebted to at least three of them this uh, you know hamida banu his grandmother salima sultan and gulbadan begum for interceding with akbar on his behalf you know keeping the relationship at least somewhat civil or on on sort of more or less working terms so that you know it doesn't become completely ele- ineligible and, and as you point out the later intercede with uh, jahangir on khusro's behalf no but they do on behalf of mirza aziz koka so jahangir wants to he, he's you know always had a thing in his because mirza aziz has supported khusro yeah okay. uh, and so when he gets his opportunity he 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 wants to uh, certainly put him in prison possibly worse uh but uh, the the women are listening from behind the screen and they and they call out and they uh they stop him so yeah so they have an influence on and that after you know nur jahan she becomes as powerful as she does and it's exceptional but it doesn't happen in a vacuum you know there's there's enough precedent for uh, powerful women mm. No, I, I, and it's interesting that you know even Noor Jahan's origin story is kind of you know mm-hmm. interesting how uh, she was again not an Indian per se, not like one of the other Rajput princesses. Mm-hmm. And tell me a little bit about that. So she comes fleeing from Persia with her. No, she doesn't come. Sorry, her parents come fleeing from Persia. She is born uh, en route in Kandahar, and then uh, so there are these there is this. what is called the abandonment narrative and the abandonment of nur jahan that you know the they have uh, her mother delivers her but uh, they are poor they are in their their it's, it's a difficult journey they don't have any they don't know how they'll be able to take care of her so they leave her under a tree but they only walked a little while before uh, you know my parents decide this is not they can't do this and so her father goes back and he finds her with you know a, a sort of black snake wrapped around her or you know some variations on that theme and uh, and and then picks her up and uh, brings her uh, to agra but uh, this is not i mean this is not a story that this is a, this is a little you know sort of a sort of myth making of of yeah. nur jahan there's no such story told i, I mean jahangir certainly doesn't tell it uh so but whatever it is they came they 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 were refugees there were many refugees fl- coming in from persia at the time and they found employment in uh, akbar's court her father yas beg and then uh, i mean he's doing fairly okay but nothing spectacular and uh, under jahangir his career is arrested for quite a while he is himself arrested in fact mm-hmm. and his and his son is one of his sons is uh, arrested and killed for being part of khusro's gang khusro's second rebellion yeah so uh, so things are not looking very good for them and then in 1611 so 
six years after he becomes emperor, uh, Jahangir marries Noor Jahan, and then suddenly, you know, the the fortune of the Agyas Beg family just goes through the uh, through the roof. I mean, I mean they uh, they all become incredibly powerful and. Um, uh Noor Jahan is almost co-ruling with him in a sense mm-hmm. in fact a common criticism which you point out may have been motivated by uh Shah Jahan's uh, sort of uh, trying to rationalize his rebelling uh against Noor Jahan and the king was sort of that oh he wasn't really governing mm-hmm. he was a weak emperor Noor Jahan did all the governing mm-hmm. so a real man had to mm-hmm. come and get the job done and uh, and the actual probable thing is that Jahangir was uh egoless in the sense of he was doing what was he was sharing power with her and by all accounts they had a very uh, close friendship as well and he was sharing power with her because it was a practical thing to do that left him to hunt and to drink and mm. do the sort of uh, uh, things that uh, he kind of enjoyed what also intrigued me was the sort of political games like on the one hand Khurram the later Shah Jahan is married to her niece mm. uh, right but on the uh, other hand she then tries to get her daughter from her first marriage married to Khusro mm. but uh, Khusro refuses mm. allegedly but mm. Khurram anyway has Khusro killed later mm. and uh, that daughter ends up marrying the youngest brother Shahryar mm. and Shahryar becomes a contender to the throne mm. but then eventually when um, uh, you know and after Jahangir for a very brief while Khusro's son is sort of told that you are mm. the king mm. and then Shah Jahan just has all of them knocked off <laughs> it's a blood bath it reminded me i uh, of you know that that last scene that last montage in the godfather you know <laughs> when one after the other all the competition is being uh, is just uh, shot through the head <laughs> yeah he, he just wipes him out yeah. but his son is aurangzeb so uh, karma is on the way uh, <laughs> t- but tell me also a little bit about like when most people think of jahangir and and thanks perhaps to bollywood and mughalism they think mm. of salim and anarkali mm. did anarkali exist so there's no i mean i i just feel very bad every time i have to say this because i found people i didn't realize until after i wrote this book and started talking to people how how fond people are of the story of mm. anarkali and salim and how much uh, how people don't at all like being told that she didn't exist though i mean you know i like i, I mean there's no particular evidence for her having existed except that there's this uh, diary entry by a chap called William Finch who's again one of those early East India Company traders and he goes he, uh, again he goes to Lahore and he's um, he he says there's this uh, tomb and the tomb is of Imakkal translated as pomegranate blossom and uh, and she was uh, she was the Akbar's wife and Daniel's mother and uh, shah salim had uh, quote unquote to do with her so it's not at all the sort of epic romance that we have in mughalism it's much more sordid uh, story that he tells but tomb is there i mean lahore i think the i think the archaeological survey has offices there or some there's a sort of government office in that tomb uh, from what I've read it is said to be the tomb of one of Jahangir's wives, but not, uh, not an Arakali Sahib Jamal, who was the mother of his uh, second son, Parvez. Also, like it seemed to me that if she had existed, and if I mean the the, the story as it's told, certainly as the story as it's told in Mughalay Azam does not hold water in the context of, you know, Mughal family life because. class would certainly not have been an issue you know if 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 jahangir and jahangir could have as many concubines as he as he wanted nobody would stop him um and and marry whoever he wanted in fact there is there is an instance of him wanting to marry somebody that akbar doesn't approve of you know because he wants to marry zain khan's a nobleman's daughter or niece and he's already married to her niece and daughter so akbar doesn't like this idea of you know marrying two women who are so closely related to each other but jahangir insists and uh, and eventually you know akbar gives in and th- and that's it there's no you know it's it not doesn't become some huge uh, issue so for all these reasons it seemed to me that it wasn't i don't find it particularly credible but uh, you know yeah who knows somebody may discover something later but also i think what at some point you know <clears throat> you know the, the the stories that 
I guess you know when you're writing any 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 book or any story or any, even whether it's history or not, you know certain stories you you were more attracted to or want to tell more than others. So I thought you know this idea of this young love fighting parental opposition is a very nice story, but it has been told so many times. And for me, the more interesting story. Even if that was that an Arkley story is true, for me the more interesting story is the Noor Jahan Jangi story. You know, this this these these two people who meet um, very much in their middle age. You know, by even by today's standards, let alone those times. You know, she's in her thirties, he's in his forties. Uh, they have both been married before. I mean, not just kindly. Him. Watch your words by today's standards. Forty is very young. Forty is very young. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's the new thirty. Forty is the new late twenties. <laughs> new late twenties. Yes. So, so I just turned twenty-two. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. A few weeks ago. so yeah. So. So no, so 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 this idea of you know, I mean, he's of course been married. He's much married, but she also is not. You know, she's not. Uh, she, she's it's her second marriage too. She already has a child uh, by her first marriage. They don't have any children together. He never marries again after that. She is his last wife. They seem to share a relationship of some degree of equality, some degree of mutual respect. They clearly have similar interests. You know, I mean, he. Mm. Is addicted to hunting, as we've already established. She's supposed to be a really good she's, shot. She's supposed to be a really good shot, yeah. And you know, he has a an interest in 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 sort of jewelry and clothes and sort of be- beauty. Mm. So does she? You know, she's she's sort of uh, that um, the uh, the tomb of her father, Itimad Dalla's tomb in 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 Agra, is really a really gorgeous little little monument. Uh, so they have both have a very finely developed aesthetic sense. They both enjoy, uh, you know, feasting and partying and traveling. You know, they travel together up and down the country. This is a very so, nice anecdote in your uh, uh, book about the lights of the city going off because mm-hmm. you know they're they're coming back from somewhere together in a bullock cart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's riding a bullock cart yeah. and she's by his side, and yeah. his people feel the emperor should not be seen like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just a couple enjoying a really yeah. nice moment. Yeah. No, no, not the emperor not be seen like this. Oh, okay. So they put off the lights because uh, so to keep her in parda because she's uh-huh. she's yeah. out. No, she's sitting with him, mm-hmm. so she's not she's not she's not. Uh, yeah, so the did. absence of light as a yes. parda of sorts. Yeah. Wow. So the absence of light as parda and this, you know, he's commanded a bullock cart from somewhere and the two of them are riding. I thought it's a lovely image. And uh, yeah, to me it captures something of that, something of the sort of carefree, that kind of carefree love or carefree affection, which I think comes later in life you know young passion is not is not yeah. carefree in that way this is a mature settled love mm. and it doesn't even seem to be so say affected by like you know we know power corrupts power the road people especially the massive power that a mughal emperor must have mm. but this seems to be quite removed from all of that it's just genuine affection it comes yeah. across you yeah. know and uh, so that was the story that i i liked that story better and uh, so that was the one that I was more interested in, uh, anyway. That's a very powerful story. We've already spoken for more than a couple of hours. Tell me something. I I see sort of two uh, kind of divergent trends. And one trend is, of course, that history is used more and more these days as a political tool. It's simplified, and you know, so you'll paint. Um, uh, historical figures in either black or white and use it to suit your narrative purposes, whatever mm-hmm. they might be, uh, which indicates that simplistic narratives, maybe another illustration of this is the uh, romance between the alleged and Arkali and mm-hmm. Jangi, that simplistic narratives have an appeal to us. We can mm-hmm. all get it. Our mind is not, our mind resists complexities. But yet, mm-hmm. I see in modern times, uh, in the last uh, uh, two or three decades in the rest of the world and maybe now over here with people like you and Manu Pillay and Ira Mukherti and Rana Safi coming along, that there is also this readership developing, this hunger developing for popular history where people just love these stories. Mm. They can take the complexity. You know, they are not choosing simple binaries. There is a hunger for these. And part of these I have um, mused in the past is perhaps because we, we love stories. That's how we explain the world to each other. Mm. And where can you get better stories than in our history, especially India's history is just 
wild and mind boggling and uh, so entertaining and these are two divergent things i mean one is history as a political tool being simplified binaries but the other is that people just love history what what are your thoughts on this no i think i think you both the way you've put it is really that's it's true that you know people love history people also like at a certain level i think in school particularly you will find you know that almost near near unanimous agreement that history is just the most boring subject and uh, maths is the most incomprehensible you know and possibly for similar reasons because they are both taught in these abstract terms that seem to have no relevance to to real life you know those those mathematical formulas i still don't know what it was that i was memorizing and to what end and similarly with you know this history and uh, well, that's what we think started off talking uh, and at the same time it's also you know in our current uh, political life excites great passions and you know great uh, anger and um so you know i don't know if you read um, this book that's come out recently called malevolent republic of course yes. by kapil comrade yes. yeah i i just finished reading it i thought it was very polemical very compelling very i, I enjoyed it very much i can't, i don't know whether i agreed with every part of it but it was it was Ditto. very i there were parts i didn't agree with but i, I it was extremely thought provoking mm. and so well written and in fact i was kapil to be on my show and he's agreed but we've never actually managed to make Uh, be in the same place at the same time. So one yeah. day we will make that work. Well, I will look forward to hearing, uh, hearing yeah. him. But talk to continue you. with your thought. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 I, so I felt very similar. I mean, I, I enjoyed it very much. And he has these asides, if you remember, on on history, and and he and he uh, uh, and he and he basically his argument is that a certain type of uh, nationalist, mostly leftist historian, has not been entirely accurate about the past. Has sort of papered over the. the sins of uh, you know uh, muslim invaders uh, while uh, only attacking uh, european colonizers and i'm not sure if i entirely agree with this you know there are there are many writings of many sorts on the many many different types of uh, muslim rulers that india has has had uh, but uh, but i do i think that that he is right in the sense that there has been a certain sense of nation building that has informed the writing of history and it's not surprising in a you know in a post colonial country when the entire country's every all resources are concentrated on keeping the country one so naturally history also comes into that mm-hmm. so that i think perhaps accounts for the fact that you know history in the way that we are taught it is all you know worthy worthy uh, not just great men and women but worthy men and women virtuous all the, men virtuous men and virtuous men and women who have been virtuously working from you know ancient times from buddha onwards they were all working to make uh, india a uh, sort of uh, the, the the nation state uh, that it is and the problem with that is i mean one of course that it turns history into something that can be a little boring and you know just sort of talking down It's a kind of a morality play more than anything else, but also that it can be uh, that it can be flipped, you know. So suddenly, you know, after decades of doing this, the 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 country's sense of itself now depends on uh, what happened in the past or how we say what happened in the past. So suddenly, the country, you know, the you know the nation wants to know why. Aurangzeb did this, so you know how dare he break these temples, or what is Tipu Sultan doing in our textbook, and so it becomes. There's some there's something sort of disproportionate, you know. The past takes on a disproportionate uh, relevance to the present, and then from there, of course, it almost very too, too easily that uh, the present then has to be spent uh, writing these supposed wrongs uh, from the past, and uh, and that doesn't spell very good news for our uh, you know yeah, future. I, 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 and I think there's some mistake <laughs> that comes both from the right and the left. Uh, like I, I, my friend, the political commentator Sadhanand Dhume was on the show a few months ago, and he made the very interesting point that whenever he appears <coughs> on these TV talk shows with um, uh, right wingers supporters of uh, uh, the current dispensation. he find that they seem to have almost this warped sense of time where what happened yesterday is as relevant as what happened in the 1500s and you know the fact that babar breaking a mosque can have uh, ripples of repercussion through the uh, centuries 
is uh, both perverse and uh, almost kind of uh, uh, stunning. So, so to, and you, you know, I whenever I end my show and I'm talking to my guest about a particular subject, mm-hmm. I'll um, ask this uh, almost cliched question by now when people on Twitter make fun of me for asking mm-hmm. it every time, which is what gives you hope and what gives you despair about X, Y, Z and so on. Given these sort of divergent trends of history, that on the one hand, it's a political tool and that you know, perhaps a study of history in many cases is affected by the ideological lens that you bring to bear mm. upon it. And that's one side of the mm. situation. But the other side is that more and more people have access to uh, uh, historical documents and are showing greater interest in uh, books of mm. history, mm. Uh, you know, such as by people like you. What gives you uh, hope and what gives you despair about the study of history or, uh, over the next few years mm. and decades in India? So I think exactly these two things that you said. I think you know the the despair certainly comes from the the fact that uh, you know, like you're saying, uh, Sadhanand Hume said that you know we, it's almost like we are fighting our elections in uh, in the 16th century or 17th century. You know, those are the those are the burning topics of the day. You know, we must have the Mughals be accountable now. Our <laughs> demand answers from them, and and it's a very it's a, it's a it's a clever thing because you know when if you're demanding answers from the Mughals, then you don't have time to demand answers from your current. Uh, rulers or current government, you know, all the tension is just <laughs> over there. And um, even that, you know, today we are talking and I, mean, I, I don't know the, the whole news yet, but that, you know, Section 144 should have been imposed on many parts, many cities in the country. We are because, recording this on the day of the Ayodhya judgment, by the way. So, Yeah, and, and you know, imagine that to, to, that these are the kind of debates that we are embroiled in. And yet, at the same time, this very fact that you know, I find, uh, you know, the, that uh, one of the one of the nicest, uh, most heartening things about writing with this book was that uh, whenever I have spoken, not just you know, spoken outside or uh, met people or people who have read it, there's been such a huge amount of interest and curiosity that. Uh, uh, that obviously exists, and people, people, perhaps as a result of this, perhaps because of this kind of, uh, you know, these these visceral emotional reactions that are that are sort of taking over our public discourse. Perhaps because of this, uh, people now want to know what, uh, what really happened. And secondly, you know, people that you meet every day are very happy to enjoy history. You know, I mean, I think that's the the all these complications and these nuances and all these wheels within wheels and stories within stories and all the sort of soap opera-ness of it is what makes it so interesting and thrilling and absorbing, you know, because these are stories and people want to hear those stories and there's nothing about the complication that puts them off. In fact, that's what attracts people. So, and I think the fact that, you know, more and more people are writing this kind of book is obviously an answer to a sort of a growing demand and that... Um, that is definitely a good, good. I think nice, uh, hopeful sign that uh, um, people are not just willing, but uh, but want to sort of take a deep dive into into the past and and just swim around, you know, looking at the fish and the corals, not judging all of it or getting hyper excited about all of it but just enjoying the view. No, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, you know, I feel extremely hopeful about the fact that. I mean, I just think the more people dive into these stories as you put about and swim about in these strange waters, that they will begin to uh, get rid of the otherness of others. Mm. And hopefully through, uh, uh, you know, uh, b- books like uh, you and your Elka writing. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Parvati. Thank you very much, Amit. It was lovely to be here. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, hop on over to your nearest bookstore online or offline and pick up Jahangir, an intimate portrait of a great Mughal by Parvati Sharma. I promise you'll finish it in one sitting. That's exactly what I did. Uh, Parvati, very smartly because she's written so many books, is not on social media, but I am. You can follow me on Twitter at Amit Verma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. You can browse past episodes of The Seen and the Unseen on seenunseen.ie and ivmpodcast.com and thinkpragati.com. The Seen and the Unseen is supported by the Takshashila Institution. Their postgraduate courses start in January. Check them out at takshashila.org. Thank you for listening and don't behead anyone today, poor Abu Fasal.
The modern world is obsessed with food and agriculture. Everywhere you look, new and exciting technologies are bringing food innovation to your street market, your grocery store, your doorstep, and your plate. From our quest for the perfect food photos to our rediscovery of ancient grains, quite simply, food has never been sexier. But guess what? The modern food system is broken. It's a major cause of climate change, antibiotic resistance, and global poverty. So how did we get here, and where are we going? Most importantly, how are we going to feed 10 billion people globally by the year 2050 through better, more sustainable means? I'm Varun Deshpande, and I'm Ramya Ramurthy, and we work for the Good Food Institute, a global non-profit accelerating the transformation to a more healthy, sustainable, and just food system. The next food revolution is here. On Feeding 10 Billion, we're giving you the inside view. You can tune into us every Tuesday on the IVM Podcast app or ivmpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts from. Hi, I'm Satyajit. Hi, I'm Racheta. We are from the Open Library Project and we host a podcast called Paperback. Paperback is a podcast where we engage with stalwarts and experts from various industries, suggesting non-fiction titles that contributed to their journey in a big way. We've had guests like Anjali Rena, Dr. Marcus Rani, Dr. Swati Loda, Ambi Parmeswaran, Apurva Damani and many more on our show Paperback. Find new episodes every Wednesday on IVM Podcast app, website or wherever you listen to podcasts.